Tá certo. Namo Guru Ibe Namo Ibe Daya Namo Dharmaya Namo Sangaya Namo Chao 
Sai lai sai wai de me ai me ai ze ai be te re ai je ai je ai re ai se te ai me ai je ai be wai bo ai ja ai be te ai bo ai ma ai le. ใจเอาซ้อนเบลเอ็นดอขอใจเอาเข้าเบลใจเอาซ้อนเข้าลอยซ้อนเข้าเบลใจเอาเข้าเบลลอยมาเรียนบ่อยเจตายสู้เจอรอเปลี่ยนเมื่อยเดียวชอยอลอกอยเดียวเจอรอกอยเนี่ยเจอรอกอยสู้ Oh, 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 oh,
Let me remind uh, every one of ourselves to take a moment and cultivate uh, the altruistic uh, motivation, seeking complete enlightenment for the benefit of all other sentient beings. Uh, with that kind of at least uh, contrived uh, bodhicitta motivation, uh, we should participate uh, in this discourse on Bodhisattva's way of life. <laughs> Then uh, those who, of you who are following uh, uh, Bodhisattva Mahasattva Shantideva's uh, A Guide to Bodhisattva's Way of Life or Bodhisattva Char Avatar, Jinjuk in Tibetan, uh, we are on uh, chapter 4 uh, that deals with uh, consciousness. Uh, and, uh, but we haven't really uh, touched the uh, original verses so much. As Kechala is uh, reading this extensive commentary on uh, the guide, uh, uh, so he uh, uh, was explaining to us uh, uh, Bodhisattva ethics or the commitments, and we already talked about uh, the 18th uh, root uh, transgressions or the downfalls or the defeat, Tsautung Chöpje in Tibetan, uh, of uh, Bodhisattva uh, practice. And of course, uh, we talked about how 
you know, four of those uh, root transgressions or downfalls uh, are explicitly mentioned in uh, Arya Asanka's uh, Bodhisattva Bhumi, the levels of Bodhisattvas, Changsa, and the remaining are mentioned in uh, Agash Garba Sutra, Sutra requested for by Bodhisattva by the name of Space. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we went through uh, different scholarly standpoints, uh, how a number of scholars uh, such as uh, the Sakya patriarchs, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, I mean, contend uh, that um, the four uh, root transgressions uh, in the Bodhisattva Bhumi are from Chitta Martin point of view, mind only school point of view, and uh, the root transgressions explained uh, uh, in the, the Akashkarpa Sutra are from Madhyamik or the middle way point of view. Uh, but our standpoint is that, uh, uh, you know, the 18 root transgressions are, are just the same uh, regardless of uh, what philosophical standpoints we take. So those philosophical standpoints uh, really do not, uh, so to speak, make any uh, difference here. Uh, and uh, so that's where we left off, uh, uh, you know, last week. Uh, so today we will continue our discussion in the sense, cheba, meaning, uh, you know, what are the uh, consequences uh, of uh, you know, indulging in the, uh, the root uh, downfalls or uh, the transgressions. Yes. So as I mentioned that we will talk about the cheba or the consequences of uh, uh, root transgressions. Uh, as Keshala uh, read uh, 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 from the uh, commentary uh, that uh, I mean, root transgressions are uh, very serious uh, uh, matters. Uh, even if uh, we commit uh, just one uh, root transgressions or downfall, uh, that is, uh, you know, serious uh, in itself in that uh, it is said uh, that in this lifetime, you know, we may not be able to attain uh, the first spiritual ground of Bodhisattvas, the joyous uh, ground of the Bhumi. It's that serious. So if... Uh, you know, uh, transcribing one of them is that serious, and if you do it over and again, or many of them, you know, how consequential uh, it would be. We can kind of uh, you know, estimate uh, uh, that. And of course, uh, by transgressing any of those uh, root vows, uh, you know, in the future, we will be reborn in uh, uh, unfortunate states uh, for a long time, and, uh, you know, we might end up in the samsara uh, for a long, a long, long time. Yeah, so those are the consequences of uh, a root transgression or defeat or downfall, Pamba. And uh, uh, so we know that uh, you know, we can retake the Bodhisattva vows and restore our uh, uh, you know, a root uh, vows, uh, uh, but that should not be uh, taken lightly as, as an excuse uh, to uh, take easy with uh, the transgressions as if you can restore them again, because those are very uh, consequences. Uh, quintial, as we just talked about. Uh, so therefore, uh, it is said uh, that when it comes to root transgressions, uh, you know, we should really guard them even at the expense of our life. Sogde means like, you know, we uh, risk our life uh, to, uh, you know, uh, observe them. So which means we really have to understand the root transgressions, which we already talked about. In order to be able to observe them, we have to know, uh, you know, every one of them. Yes. 
So remember that when we look at uh, the list of uh, 18 uh, root uh, transgressions or defeats, uh, there are two uh, you know, exceptions which are uh, forsaking bodhicitta or abandoning bodhicitta, altruism, and uh, holding a wrong view or distorted view. In the case of each of these, uh, if we uh, indulge in these uh, you know, actions, uh, in inner with self, it constitutes uh, a root transgression or downfall. We do not need any other conditioning factors here, right? Because we hold a wrong view, distorted, that is a root transgression, or we give up bodhicitta, there goes, there is a root transgression. With the remaining 16 uh, uh, you know, root transgressions, as we talk about this, for each of them to constitute a root downfall or transgression, you know, we have to look at what is called uh, the four fetters, quinty, literal translating, or four conditioning uh, factors. Yeah, so in the commentary, they talk about uh, you know, those conditioning factors in terms of intensity. There is the great, middling, and the small. Right, three categories, great, middling, and small. Uh, and uh, so uh, for 16 of them, you know, for uh, a particular uh, transgression to be a root transgression, it has to be what called greatly intense uh, conditioning factor, uh, meaning that all the four conditioning factors that we already talked about must be present, then it means that's a full-fledged uh, root transgression. But if all the factors are not present, right, so maybe just one or two, whatever, then we can talk about, uh, you know, middling intensity or the small intensity. Yeah, so middling intensity fat, uh, conditioning factors and small uh, you know, intensity conditioning factors does not constitute root transgression. It is a negativity, no doubt. We have to purify it, but it does not constitute root transgression. So those are the distinctions uh, uh, being made here. And uh, so I double check with the Geshe-la, uh, all the four factors, uh, you know, more or less equal. Geshe-la say uh, not, because uh, usually uh, the one of them, which is Nyiming Mida, not seeing uh, wrong in doing it, right? Not seeing the fall. That is a more intense one. Usually they put it one side and the three others on the other side, right? So that one seems to be equal to the three, okay? So I'll kind of uh, summarize this again that uh, within the list of 18 root transgressions, for 16 of them, if uh, transgression involves uh, you know, all the four factors, then it is uh, great you know, intensity conditioning factors of the factors, and it is root transgression. 
If all the factors are not there, it is a negativity. It's a transgression, but not a root transgression. Are you with me so far? In the case of uh, bodhicitta, you know, giving up bodhicitta and uh, holding the wrong view or distorted view, lokta, uh, we don't need all those conditional factors. In and of itself, constitute a downfall or root transgression. It's a very serious uh, uh, matter. Uh, so as Keshla read uh, the relevant lines from the commentary, uh, which uh, explain that uh, if uh, the conditioning factors or the factors is a great intensity, right, great, uh, then uh, so any of uh, the 16 uh, root transgressions we talk about, it really constitute a root transgression. If all the conditioning factors are not present, then it may very well be middling intensity or negativity or a small intensity negativity, which means it's not a root transgression, maybe it becomes more like secondary uh, transgression. Okay, so those are the distinctions uh, uh, being uh, uh, made. Uh, and um, so as Keshala uh, explained, uh, comparing it, uh, Bodhisattva ethics, to that of uh, you know, monastic ethics, the monastic ethics have many more classifications or categories of ethics, right? You can talk about uh, root transgression or defeat. Then you can talk about uh, a category of uh, what we call almost like a secondary one called lagma, uh, extra uh, kind of a, uh, a curricular uh, transgressions there, and then there are the categories called mangeba, like an uncertain category, things like that. There's so many uh, kind of classifications. But in the case of Bodhisattvas, it's kind of a, you know, a minimal, right? We can talk about uh, root transgression, pamba. So if it's not a root transgression, then it's a negativity, more like a secondary one, right? So we don't have too many uh, classification systems uh, uh, dealing with uh, Bodhisattva uh, ethics. Mm uh Yela 
So remember that we talked about uh, the four uh, factors, literally translated in Quinty, factors means binding factors, uh, factors, or I call it conditioning uh, factors, which is easy to remember. And so those are, uh, you know, we talked about uh, like a, a sense of joy or delight in indulging in negativity, right? Kawa means you happily uh, do it. Uh, then after you do it, you feel very satisfied. Ah, I did it, right? That's the level of satisfaction. And the lack of sense of shame uh, and the lack of sense of decency or sense of embarrassment. Right? So those are the four uh, binding factors, okay? Uh, that we already talked about. And now that I think commentary goes into kind of differentiating what constitute uh, great intensity, uh, you know, binding factors and the middling and the small. And in the case of the great, uh, uh, say if uh, you indulge uh, in the, one of the transgressions very delightedly, happily, right? And then once you have done it, you're like, ah, you know, what a big deal, right? You kind of have a satisfaction then these uh, binding factors really make your uh, transgression uh, a great intense, greatly intensified transgression, so it's a root transgression. Or that, uh, you know, when we indulge in the, such transgression, you know, we don't have, we neither have sense of shame, moza, or sense of decency or embarrassment, tell you, yeah? Uh, and so that would constitute uh, uh, a root transgression, as Keshla explained the distinction between the Ngoza and Telyu, which in English uh, sometimes it's very hard to get the distinction. Uh, Ngoza, sense of shame, you know, is uh, really defined in terms of uh, taking oneself into consideration as a reason. Like for example, you know, as a monk or a nun, if you are about to do something wrong, if you say, oh, I cannot do that, you know, I'm a monk and a nun, right, it's shameful for me to do this. So then there's a sense of shame, right? You prevent yourself from indulging in the wrong action. And the sense of decency or sense of embarrassment, uh, I like the sense of decency actually, the sense of embarrassment, anyway, uh, is defined in terms of uh, what would other people think about you, right? Okay, I'm among a nun. If I do this and other people who have faith in me in the Sangha, so they are going to feel bad about me, right? They're going to, uh, you know, um, disapprove that. So you take that into account or a reason and don't indulge in that. So that is what we call tell you, sense of decency. Are you with me so far? So if you totally lack in you know, either of them, we have no shame, no sense of decency, and we happily and joyfully and kumbaya go into that, well, there is a good transgression. You mean? But if you indulge in something, you still feel sense of shame, right? You're like, like let's say the example Geshe gave is, uh, you know, somebody steals something. Right, this is a, 
oh, I, I, yeah, stealing is really negative. I shouldn't have done that. I really need it, you know. So I kind of feel bad. I stole something. It is a negativity, but it may not constitute root transgression. But you are not satisfied. You're not happy to do it, but you did it under circumstances or some, right, I don't know, some re justifications you have. Are you with me? Now, if you do the same thing, that, wow, here's an opportunity. You know, I'm one smart person. I can just steal the whole thing. I mean, who cares, right? No, how's your sense of any feeling bad about it? Then that kind of a stealing is, right, more negative it, right? So that's what we're talking about. If we indulge in something, we don't feel good about it afterwards, or we really ask me to feel regret for doing it, it is a negativity, no doubt, but it does not constitute a root transgression. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So the in Tibetan, you know, we have these expressions called gagu, sounds like one word, but there are two things. Gawa means, you know, happy, joyful, delightful, right? And the guwa means, you know, satisfaction. Yeah? So as Geshe-la uh, gave the example already, that here is uh, an opportunity uh, to steal something, and you're happy to have this opportunity, right? Almost like once in a lifetime. Here it is, you know? So that is the joyful part, the happiness, right? The guwa is, you know, you may not succeed it, right? If you succeed in stealing the thing, and you're like, there you go. I'm really skillful and competent, you know, thief here. So satisfied, right? That's another section, satisfaction. Yeah, so uh, that's how we make the distinction between joy and satisfaction, or kawa and guwa in Tibetan. Hmm. She <laughs> So, um, this explains that, uh, you know, if all the four uh, binding uh, factors or conditioning factors are present, then, uh, you know, one's transgression would constitute uh, root transgression or downfall. If one of them is missing, let's say, you indulge in it, but you still have a sense of shame intact, right? Yeah, you really don't feel good about it, and actually, you, should, you know, that, or sense of decency, if any of one uh, condition factor is missing, then it does not constitute root transgression. Yeah? It is still transgression, secondary, but it's not root transgression. So, uh, and, um, and of course, it's important for us to be able to kind of acknowledge and see uh, what's wrong uh, you know, with transgression. You know, and uh, if you don't see anything wrong, like the exa same example Keshe is using is uh, like stealing something, you think like, well, it's just my right, you know, it's my privilege to steal, so what's wrong with that? You know, that's one attitude, okay? But whereas you steal something, you know, because you need it, and uh, you still feel bad, you know, I wish I don't have to do that, but, uh, you know, 
So then it is stealing, but you still feel something bad about it. So that kind of reduces the intensity of negativity. Yeah. Also. <laughs> Mozart <laughs> Tinja so in the case of uh, gawa, delight, joy, happiness, and guva, satisfaction, this is really looking at a continuum, so to speak, from the motivation, starting from the motivation and conclusion of the action. Yeah? And so which means that, okay, somebody is really excited to steal something. The motivation is there, right? I'm really excited. He has an opportunity, my privilege, my right. Okay, I'm go all the way, kind of motivation there. So that motivation is continuing, isn't it? Yeah. Of course, you haven't completed the action yet. So with that motivation, you indulge and you succeed in stealing something. Once you obtain it, you feel <sighs> satisfaction, right? So that concludes from the motivation to the conclusion. That's where both joy and the satisfaction are done, isn't it? But let's say you started with excitement and somehow something interrupts you, right? You feel like, oh yeah, I, sh I shouldn't be doing that, right? there's a disruption in your motivation and action, then it might change into something else, right? You're not completing the joy and satisfaction altogether, isn't it? You start excitement and you say, you know what? Yeah, I think I shouldn't do that, you know, I have some kind of vow, or, you know, something, you know, whatever it is, X, Y, Z happen. Then, you know, your, uh, that motivation disrupted, and so it doesn't complete uh, with the satisfaction, okay? So that kind of distinctions is being made. So that Gangut said, so in the case of uh, joy as a motivational factor, we have to look at its continuity, right? And the continuation has to be in that, that the intensity of that motivation is intact, isn't it? It just still keep going on, okay? It's not disrupted, interrupted by anything else. And then when you complete the action and you feel satisfied, so now the joy and satisfaction, gagu, are completed here. Uh, let's say you are very uh, kind of excited to do this, and then some in the middle, you, the intensity goes, and you lose the motivation, right? So then there is no continuity, are you with me? Because that motivation is changed into something else. Uh, so then it becomes something else. But in the case of sense of uh, shame and decency, we are not talking about the continuity. They are very advantageous, right? They just pop up in a situation and pop out. So we don't have to talk about the continuity of sense of shame or sense of decency. It just pops up, right, and 
then it evaporates. Okay. Hmm. So why these things matter is, as we said this before also, we look at the 18 uh, root transgressions, except for forsaking bodhicitta and holding the wrong view, for the rest of the 16, if all those four uh, binding factors are present, right, uh, the continuation of the joyful motivation, the satisfaction, the complete thing, no sense of shame, no sense of decency, then, you know, a particular transgression becomes root transgression. If one of the factors uh, is not present, then it is not a root transgression, it still is a transgression, maybe secondary one, okay? Yeah. Yenla I was just trying to sort uh, seek some clarification uh, with regard to uh, the four uh, binding factors, you know, sometimes it seems like we have five, you know, so we have to clarify things. So the four binding factors are, we'll uh, go through the list, joy, which is motivational factor, right? And uh, satisfaction, guwa, a sense of shame, moza, sense of decency, teyu, right? Those are the four. Uh, but way Keshara talks about how we don't see wrong in indulging in something, or we see wrong. So that goes along with uh, the motivational factor, joy. Yeah, so it's not a separate one. So there's no five. So as is explained in the commentary now, let's say, um, you know, we have uh, out of the four uh, binding factors, three of them present in our transgression. But what is lacking is uh, a part of that joy where we see there's something wrong. I shouldn't be doing it. Okay. If you feel that way, then your transgression is not a root transgression, it is a secondary. Are you with me so far? Now let's say that three of the binding factors are absent, but there is that present that you don't see anything wrong in indulging in it, right? You don't see any wrong. Then the transgression becomes a middling transgression still. It's not a number. The three are not there, but this, you know, 
you know, this troublemaker is there. I mean, he didn't say troublemaker, my footnote, right? So this one is so, right, uh, serious here. And uh, uh, now, I mean, uh, as we said, now if all the four are present, well, then it's a root transgression. It's a great intensifier one. Remember, we talk about great, middling, and small. Okay, so this is how we differentiate it. Okay, great means all the four are present, you are done, okay? And uh, the middling means that maybe the three are, are absent, but you still don't see anything wrong with it, then it's a middling, right? And uh, the, 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 the small is that, you know, uh, if you are lacking uh, that and something else, then that is uh, small, uh, uh, what called uh, transgression. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, sir. No. So we will go through the list of uh, differentiating great, middling, and small uh, infractions or transgressions. Okay. Uh, the great transgression or infraction we already know, root transgression is all the four binding factors are present. Okay? That's only in the case of the 16 of them. Okay? We are not talking about bodhicitta, uh, abandonment, and uh, the wrong view. Yeah. Uh, now, the, uh, the, the, the middling one is, let's say you still have uh, this as a part of motivation, there's something wrong about it. I shouldn't be doing it. Right? You have that sense, whereas... Uh, the uh, other three are present, the binding factors, so it's still considered as uh, uh, what we call uh, 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 as, as middling, as a middling. Now you have that, so like, is something wrong, I shouldn't be doing it, plus something else is missing in the four factor, then it becomes a small infraction. Okay, so this is how uh, we differentiate among uh, the great uh, middling and uh, small infractions or downfalls. What no. No, no, no. Yeah, some thought, uh, you know, the joy and satisfaction are one and the same thing, you know. Uh, but again, the, uh, it is to explain that uh, they are not the same because the joy is more like motivational factor, what comes in the beginning. And satisfaction is what comes at the end when you are done with action, right? So they are not one the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. ที่เกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยวกับเกี่ยว
uh, binding factors or QNG, uh, I mean, each of them is uh, a mental uh, factor, symptom, right? And they are not uh, one and the same thing. And as Kishore explained, that if we have that mental factor of seeing something is wrong, right, in negativity, well, that kind of thing wrong might facilitate the sense of shame and sense of decency. Uh, but uh, sense of shame and sense of decency and this mental factor are not one and the same thing. Yeah? They may be related in that way. Yeah? And uh, also, I shall explain that uh, it depends upon the intensity of that mental factor. Uh, you know, it is possible that you see it's not right to indulge in this, but if your sense of that is not strong, you may still indulge in that negativity. The example given is like, say, uh, as a disrupt, uh, like a monk, right? You say that you should not indulge in sexual misconduct. Okay, that's bad. But your that feeling bad is not strong enough that you must still indulge in it, right? So that feeling does not prevent you from indulging in sexual misconduct. But if you are that sense of, you know, is very strong, right? It is really bad. Shouldn't do it. Then you it will prevent you from indulging in negativity. So the intensity of the mental factor also matters. Yeah, you may see this not right to do but you may still not feel that strong and you may do it. That like it may not stop you from doing it. But the intensity is big, then it will prevent you from indulging in it. Mm. So we have talked about, uh, you know, how consequential it is uh, uh, to commit uh, a root transgression. Yeah? And so now, uh, relatedly, we will talk about, uh, you know, if we happen to uh, indulge in a root transgression, then what can we do about it? You know, how can we purify ourselves of the negativity or transgression? Uh, is there a possibility to restore uh, our vows or not, right? And uh, so, as compared to monastic vows, in the monastic vows, we also talk about uh, there are root uh, transgressions or downfalls. Uh, in the Vinaya rule, if you uh, commit one of those uh, root downfalls transgressions as a monk or nun, then you cannot be monk or nun anymore, and there's no way to restore it in this life. Okay? Uh, you are done. As far as you're concerned, you are no more monk and nun, and you cannot be again in this life. If you right, commit any of the root transgressions, downfall. That's a Vinaya rule. There's nothing can make it up. You can purify the karma, but you cannot be monk again, right, in this life. But in the case of Bodhisattva ethics, it's different, right? It's very serious to uh, commit a root transgression, but at the same time, you know, you will be able to retake the Bodhisattva vows, and you can restore your root vows. So that's really different from the monastic uh, root transgressions. Yes. What <laughs> So that because Pama Shabji, that Pama and Shabji, which has an end, that Pama Shuna Latia, so I am. That Pama Shabji, my just in part, Labji Gilm say, I shall have you, they shall be in a kissy in a tiller, any Gilm Namda, so Yam Yamia, Domania, Yoma, Labji Gilm say, I go on. There is a little tea, she could judge my mother, could you call Shilly Shilly, I must be given, give us the Nashi, Tobon Yoma. I love the chosen the tea, my is good. Pama Jing shows on the day. So they are again uh, making a comparison between the Bodhisattva 
you know, root transgressions and uh, Vinaya monastic root transgressions. Because, of course, uh, generally speaking, if uh, a, a monk or a nun uh, commit uh, any of those root transgressions, so you cannot you be a monk or a nun in this life. And uh, so, I mean, you, of course, you can purify the karma, but you cannot do anything. But then sometimes there are some different perspectives. They say, no, maybe that's a little bit too far. There could still be monk and a nun, right? They have, something went wrong. Yeah, so they have different category of that. Uh, so even if we go with that, so then that monk or nun cannot be a pure monk or nun, namda. Okay? And sometimes they don't have the same privileges as uh, you know, a pure monk and nun. Right? Even if, like say, uh, in terms of assembly, participation activities, they have to stay at the end of the row, and it's like a, almost segregation, because they really, you are not part of the pure sangha anymore. Right? So those distinctions are being made. Uh, whereas in the case of Buddhist vows, we don't have such distinctions. Yeah. You commit root, or you do your best not to commit any root transgressions, but if you happen to commit root transgressions, you can purify your you know, root transgression, and then you can retake the Buddhist vows that completely restore your vows. It's not like you know, your vows is now kind of you know, yes and no. It's not that. It's completely pure vows. You regenerate or restore it. Mm. Well, they, they are- so that you don't have a shower, man, a pump of men, you pump of times, you charge you the button. So that the pump of shona said the last so many chavon deva, the soja shogi. They are ting me, ye, a ting me, but take what may be the end of bomb by him, but so on. They were carry pump of shammy shona so that young. Nama Pune, Lana, Yero, Yabo Zobo Sunday, La Long the Yaja Deva Tana, Chansen, you don't buy La Long the Yava the Mendate, Chansen, my be, you know, the tenor, Papa Chami Shumatini, La Lang de, Yabo Zobo Tala, Tuni, you don't sing you but I do say, Chu to sing you, Tadun T, Yula, you know, the Doma Namda Jeva. Maybe said the Pamba Chami Jan Majumi, Gilon Namda La Duni, I say. Tin never Mazoba and Jar Sumi Shiros, dear da, and that the soda Gilon Gaysalon Domadina, and that Pamba Chabji, Mado Chigaza, Chami Domaton was loving, then Lady Gilon says, Shazi or the Chenako, Mazeti Chiri Chit, Yudi as Mado Jil. ก็ดอบลายคาเซจีนะมาจินะเอ็นกินน้ําตาจ้องเมื่อตอนนี้ทวายเอามาเลยสิน้องสอนเดชเจ้าซึ่งมาที่เจ้าเข้าเอามาเ
Okay, so they talk about chajin chame, right? Independent, partial or complete. So in the case of partial translation, they said, well, uh, you, you could still, right? But then, you know, they are in a very different category. You cannot be regarded among as a pure monks, yeah? And uh, in this lifetime, you cannot uh, become an arahat or a false destroyer because of, you know, uh, the transgression. So those distinctions are made in the Vinaya uh, rules categories. Uh, but not in the Bodhisattvas. The Bodhisattvas, yes, you commit root transgressions, very serious matters. You can purify your transgressions and you can retake your vows and you can have a complete set of uh, Bodhisattva vows, pure vows. Okay? Uh, so that's one distinction between the two. The another one they added to that is uh, when we say that uh, you know, in the case of Vinaya, monastic disciplines, uh, if you c commit any root transgressions, you cannot be monk anymore again, right? They think that, well, that really refers to uh, the Sharvaka Yan, right? Those who follow the hero's vehicle, okay? Maybe today's probably, uh, uh, I don't know how far is the Theravadin Yan, let's say. Hopefully, I'm not misusing this term here because nobody likes the Sharvaka, right? So let's say Theravadin Yan these days. Uh, but there's exception to the Bodhisattva monastics, okay? If the Bodhisattva monastics were to, let's say, if there's such thing as a partial transgression of Vinaya, the Bodhisattva monastics are exception to the rule because Bodhisattvas never do anything wrong motivationally. Whatever they do it is for the sake of, right? Altruism and other factors. So therefore, if it is a Bodhisattva monastic, maybe there is a second chance. Are you with me? So they make those distinctions. Now you see all the minutiae details coming up, right? So there is, you know, a category of monastics called Lepsi Gelong, which is, I would say, something like probationary, probationary, like a Sangha or a monk. And in reality, they are really uh, almost as good as those who have not taken the monastic ordination. Uh, but there is a category called probationary Sangha. Uh, and uh, so, as we said, they're not a pure monk, like the one exactly, uh, but they said they're a different category in, of itself. But in reality, I mean, they are no more different from a lay person. Okay. Mm. ตั้งบ่เอ่อสงสัยนั้นลองบ่ตั้งตัวสิงจังเสร็จแล้วเชิญนี่ไปแก้วอยู่ดีอยู่นอพันปัชชวนชินดีแก้วไม่ว่าค
so why is that that kind of a distinction and Bodhisattva monastics, uh, you know, breaking any Vinaya rules is an exception to the case? And why is so serious for the, you know, Sharvaga monks or Theravada monks? If you break the root vows, then in this life uh, you cannot be monk again. Uh, the distinction is attributed to the power of the bodhicitta, right? Bodhisattvas really, uh, the bodhicitta or the altruism, you know, is the difference. Because of that altruism, that bodhisattvas, uh, monks, hypothetically speaking, if they were to uh, break uh, a root monastic vows, they could retake it. Yeah. <laughs> ラジオズルメジュジンチヘナスティアナカレスティニラライネニラサティバメンバイナエネパパシュヤヨジョナムダレヤメダシャンジュセバナムダレコカレスティニジンシゲセリヘネティネンディンディチェルティバシュジン
And they did not necessarily say in this lifetime. That may very well be true, but all many lifetimes, right? So because of that, the Bodhisattva vows, right, the commitment is until you reach enlightened man, not until you die. The monastic vows is until you die, right? So those distinctions is why uh, the, 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 I mean, the exception uh, thing happened. So this kind of distinctions being made uh, is really uh, what we uh, have learned from uh, our lineage uh, masters making the distinctions based upon a uh, sutra called uh, Tabla Kebe Do, uh, you know, a sutra of skillful means, which really deals with the root transgressions. And then the sutra requested for by a person called Never Court, right? That sutra. And so based upon those things, uh, our lineage masters make those distinctions, you know, the thing we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Jani so the subtle distinction is being made is that, uh, you know, where we said that uh, in the case of uh, Sharavaka Yan uh, monastic ordination uh, tradition, if you uh, break a root vow, then uh, you know, whether we call it uh, partial transgression or whatever, you cannot be pure monk anymore in this lifetime and you cannot retake it again, right? Uh, and uh, so that's the thing. The other thing we said is, in the case of Bodhisattvas with the, with the, uh, with, uh, with the Parthamoksha vows, right? Or monastic ordinations. And if you were to break a root vow, whether it calls partial transgression, there is a possibility for you to retake it again. Right, you could still be a pure mom. So, so some call that, well, that's the distinction between Mahayana tradition and uh, the, the, uh, the Sharvagayana tradition. That's the wrong use of the uh, you know, perspective. They said, whether it's a Mahayana tradition or the Ther- uh, Theravadan tradition, you know, the, the, it is the same that uh, when you break the monastic root vows, right, partially, you cannot be a monk in this life uh, anymore. But the distinction subtle we are making is here we are saying is that if the person, practitioner, is a Mahayanist, meaning has a bodhicitta, right? We are not talking about Mahayana tradition. The person is a Mahayanist, 
right? It's different from the tradition. The person is a Mahayanist uh, Bodhisattva, and you have a monastic ordination, and you happen to break, right, a root vow, so you could still take it again. So it's not to do with the minor perspective or anything because of your bodhicitta, because of being a Mahayanist. Uh, so that's the distinction. Yeah, you see the subtle distinction there? Yeah. Mm. Conditions Sangset Mitongo so how do we uh, lose uh, Bodhisattva vows or how we become devoid of Bodhisattva vows, right? More fancy way to say that one. And um, in the Bodhisattva Bhumis or the levels of Bodhisattva, Shangsa, they talk about two causes, you know, that can make us devoid of, uh, you know, Bodhisattva vows. Uh, number one is if we give up Bodhicitta, we forsake Bodhicitta, uh, then we will not have Bodhisattva vows. Okay, that's one cause. Uh, the second cause is that uh, if our you know, transgression involves all the four binding factors. It is called the great uh, intensity uh, uh, binding factors. Then we are deprived of uh, bodhisattva vows. Yeah? So those are the two th causes of uh, losing bodhisattva vows talked about in bodhisattva bhumi, Changsa. In the Vinaya, so they said if you as a bodhisattva generate uh, the, uh, the mindset of uh, Sharvaka, right? Uh, then you lose Bodhisattva vows. That makes sense, right? You give a Bodhicitta. Now, I mean, my footnote, instead of seeking enlightenment, now you want your, your Nirvana, right? So you have that state of mind, then you lose Bodhisattva vows because your attitude changed. Okay? That's in the Vinaya. Uh, the other way to lose the Bodhisattva vows is by giving back, right? That uh, happens in both uh, Kut. And that's the one option there in both Vinaya and Bodhisattva vows. In the Vinaya, if somebody says, okay, now I cannot, you know, think I can be monk anymore, so I would like to return my vows, or I want to give back my vows. So if you tell someone I mean, who understands that you don't want monk anymore, and that person understood you, then you lose all your monastic vows. Yeah? In the case of Bodhisattva, right, vows, you tell someone, about, uh, yeah, now I don't think I can do this anymore, right? So and I'm going to kind of uh, give it up or sort of thing. Then if the other person understood it, you lose all the Bodhisattva vows. So those are the different ways uh, that can deprive us of, uh, you know, Bodhisattva uh, uh, ethics of the vows. Mm. 
So ultimately we go back to what is talked about in the Bodhisattva Bhumi, Bodhisattva levels, right? What is said in other things is more like a commentary on this. So there are only three, there, no, not only, I should say, there are three ways mentioned in the Bodhisattva Bhumi where we could lose our Bodhisattva ethics or we can deprive ourselves of Bodhisattva ethics. Number one is we give up Bodhicitta, we forsake. Yeah? Number two is that our you know, transgression involves the four uh, binding factors, right? Root transgression. Uh, number three, we return our vows, we will give back. So those are the three ways in which uh, we could uh, deprive ourselves of uh, uh, Bodhisattva vows. Simjita ตัวเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียงเสียง
karma uh, in bad migrations. So I just kind of asked a follow-up question, uh, but we could still take the Bodhisattva vows again, right, if we return it. He said, yeah, you could take it again, uh, but the thing is that you broke your promise first, right? So it just kind of affects it, you know, uh, it, yeah. So there are differences uh, between uh, even uh, the process or the procedures by which we take uh, monastic <laughs> ordination, Pratimoksha vows, and the Bodhisattva vows. In the case of Bodhisattva vows, as we said this before, I mean, you uh, can study Bodhisattva vows and then you can decide whether you would like to take them or not, right? It is kind of like an open book. You know, you can go and the Lama will explain these other Bodhisattva vows. Do you think you would like to keep this? You can keep this or not, right? So everything is in front of you. And so once you study them and you make a decision and take it, right, they said, you know, then, you know, uh, it's better don't get involved in returning them, you know, because right from the beginning, there was nothing secret, nothing is hidden from you. Everything is told to you as it is. In the case of the Vinaya vows, the Parthi Moksha, Parthi Mokha vows, it's slightly different. In the Vinaya, you know, sometimes, you know, there's a lot of vows are kind of uh, hidden somewhere, almost like categorically, right? It seems like to encourage you almost like in the beginning, there's, well, there's 10 really vows you should keep it. Actually, Jin has so many other things in it, right? And so that's why, like, it seems like Lord Six. Then you learn, as you take full ordination, you realize that's 253 vows, you know? And uh, so until you take them, you have no opportunity to study them because the, uh, um, that's not taught, uh, restricted. And so it is different, the, how things are done, right? But if you really look carefully between the distinction between uh, novice monk vows and the fully ordained mouse, right, in terms of number, right, one has 253, one has 36 or something, but the actual really difference is that of 18 vows, that would make a real difference, you know. So that's why it's slightly different. In the Vinaya, sort of encouragement, they give you only a little bit so that you don't feel discouraged, and then later you realize uh, there are more, you know, waiting for you. But in the, in the Bodhisattva, there is no secret anymore. Right from the beginning, they told you everything, and you decide, and that's how there are distinctions. Don't 
این میش ما یه تون کار لیاش چون زد دو پیش اونو کرد دو بات پوند دوست لارم آدرسیه پیر کیتا دو بات چه بازی داشت چون زد دو بات پیش اون دیگر است دیگه تیو چه زنی رو یاد ماری است دو بات میاد به دو بات سوم رو ماری است پیش اون دیگر است سوم رو ماری است پیش اون دیگر است آدای یه میو شاری که آیا رو نه 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 وی اولی وی سعیت دات از این یه نه یو کن ریترن دو بات ساده واس تو سامان you know, who can understand that now you don't want to practice it anymore, you don't want to be Buddhist or whatever. If that person understood you, then you lose all the vows, right? You're devoid of that. So it looks like there is a there is an option for you to return the Buddhist or vows, but that's a, that isn't. You know, that just simply says how you could be you could devoid yourself of the vows. If that's one way. If you tell someone who understands what you mean it then you lose the vows. But that's not a permission to return the vows. Okay? But in the Vinaya, there's a permission for somebody, for a monk, to return the vow. There is actual procedure in the Vinaya. Uh, so those are the distinctions. So we will stop there today, and we will welcome you some questions there. If not, we have two birthdays to celebrate. So depending upon, if there are one or two questions, maybe we can do. If there are too many, uh, we could just do one or two. <laughs> There's only question, one question online, and it says, are binding factors the same as kleshas? What? Are binding factors the same as kleshas? Are binding factors kleshas? Mm -hmm. You mean, are they delusions? Is that the question? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. They can't show you again, and the target on it, that again, Kundi Shi Sumbar Wagen. Kundi Shi. Quindi se sanno che non c'è un giudice, 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 non c'è uh, so in general, joy, satisfaction, sense of decency, sense of shame are not uh, necessarily afflictive emotions. But the four binding factors, because they are related to negativities, so Keshila said, yeah, I would say these are afflictive emotions, right? Uh, uh, you're joyful to break your vows, you know, joyfully. You're joyfully satisfied that you did it. You know, you're joyfully not shamed at all. You're joyfully have no sense of decency, right? So these are, we can think, it's afflictive emotions, okay? So thank you very much uh, for your consideration there, uh, invisible people on the social media. So thank you for just asking one question today. Uh, so we have, um, you know, two birthdays to celebrate today. Um, uh, one is uh, our very kind, uh, you know, guru, uh, Keshala here, uh, who is, uh, you know, 80 plus young. And uh, actually his birthday uh, is uh, 22nd of this month, uh, but we don't meet 22nd here. So we are uh, celebrating his birthday with a very delicious uh, fruit cake. Okay? And the other birthday is uh, the birthday of... Uh, you know, the young ringanet of His Eminence, Lati Rinpoche, uh, who is nine years old. And actually, it's interesting, right? In India, it is his real birthday, right? We are just one day behind. And uh, his is uh, September 28th. And so we have uh, in another cake uh, with, uh, you know, the wheel of the Dharma Chakra imprinted on it. Uh, and uh, so we uh, would like to wish together uh, Lata Rinpoche and Geshe La to have a long and healthy life and uh, so that we will have uh, the opportunity to listen to their teachings, you know, forever and forever. In the case of young Rinpoche, we would like him to grow up, uh, you know, uh, to fulfill uh, the, uh, the visions of his predecessor, uh, that he become, you know, exactly like that. Uh, and uh, so that we will have opportunity to see him and receive teachings from him yeah, soon. Yeah. Uh, so with those, after we, we do the dedication prayers and everything, and then we'll offer the uh, birthday cake. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 
Kangye Maria Munze, Dunge, Nyogo, Chinye, Junze, Raji, Nan, Dene, Daji, Sajud, Yunde, Lunzo, Yase, Tuyu, Go, Juda, Juda, Jun, Dalu, Mun, Jambe, Yang, La, Du, Omara, Baza, Nan, Dini, 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 Omara Baza Nandi Zende Kyogi Kenra Vizi Ye Dalu Timu Mimba Rapsi Kada Denju Shunlu Tongba Lodu Bove Nau Zendu Su Changju Simju Rinbo Si Maje Panan Jin Kewa Nyamba Mewa Nang Kone Kong Pewa Shu Tongyi Tawa Rinbo Si Maje Panan Jinju Kewa nyamba mewa yang kone kong pe wara jo sa shi pe shi ju shi me do chang ri ra ning shi nyin de yim Jai shin to mi de vi wa lu gu nam da shin la ju bo ra shu kang ri ra ve gu ve shin De wa ma lu ju ve jen re se wa ding jing ya Shabhe Siddhe Bhattu Deng Yu Ji Chi Zhuang Lame Gu Zhe Rab Deng Ji Nam Ka Chen Le Chou Chou Ru Ye Ba Lo San Deng Be Deng Me Sa Zum Ji Do Ye Min Zhe Ta Du Ni Yu Ru Ji Yi Dan Gu Ru Ra Na Man De L Ni Yan Ta Ya Min Ye Wa Kun Du Yang Da La Man Da Le Me Che Ji Pe La Long Ji Ji Sa Da Lu Ji Yun De Ra Zhi Doji Changge Go Ba Nyu Do Shu. Just to honor our American tradition, I'll just sing the happy birthday just once only for both of them. Kunaz Luk Su Che, the Kiega Gikki Shej Pish of Slova King, the Dikiega Rova King. So I'll say Rinpo Che and Kishe La, okay, that's how it will be. And uh, we are offering a piece of cake from Geshe Lash to His Holiness. And right on the top uh, is a uh, you know, beautifully curved uh, lotus uh, shaped uh, um, apples for Geshe Lash. Unfortunately, he can't eat his own cake okay. because of uh, <laughs> you know, who he is. And, uh, and then we will also cut a piece from Latin Ramachis and offer to His Holiness too. So then we will 
ask one of you to help write. That's it. Finish. I'm asking this. Yeah. So we're done. Done. Yeah. Thank you very much.